This is episode number 185 of the Mixology Talk podcast. And in this podcast, we're going to learn a little bit more about the spirit of vodka. I know everybody has their own feelings about vodka. You either love it, you hate it, you think it's the worst thing in the world and you want to throw it in the trash. Uh, yeah, there's some polarizing opinions about this particular spirit. So today we're going to learn a little bit more about it and hopefully change some of our mindsets around it and show that it does have a place in craft cocktails. So let's get into it, shall we? Everyone, we're back with another episode of Mixology Talk Podcast. Uh, we have a return guest. It doesn't happen very often, uh, but H from Elixir and a couple other companies is uh, here to kind of talk to us about vodka, some of the misconceptions about it, and some of the beauties of it as well. So uh, thanks for joining, H. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, something that might have changed since the last time you and I talked is every month now, we kind of do a deep dive into one particular topic. Um, sometimes it was tiki, some of it was smoked ingredients in cocktails this last month, um, is vodka. And I know there's a lot of love and hate about vodka. Um, so I know, um, you have a nice history with vodka. Um, so I thought it'd be great to have you on and, and kind of talk about, um, some of your love and, um, background with vodka. Yeah. I, you know, it's, uh, it's been an interesting ride for vodka in the last 15 years, I think. Um, it seems to be, I think it's actually seems to be coming back um, from getting beat up 10 years ago, but I don't know. I don't pay much attention to, you know, sales statistics and, and market trends on what's surging and stuff. Cause I'm not, a, you know, I don't, I don't work for a vodka brand right now. I don't work for any, any spirit brands and I'm not really concerned with those sales numbers, but mm -hmm. speaking as a bar operator and, and, someone who's observant, I guess. <laughs> it seems to be doing better these days. Yeah, I think I uh, on my news feed a couple weeks ago, I saw that um, since COVID started that more people are drinking vodka because it's an easy spirit to mix with at home. Um, just anecdotally, there was no numbers behind it. I was like, okay, that's interesting. I could see that. Um, also, kind of like when we talk about craft cocktails, um, I think I, you know, I've been doing in the craft cocktail scene, mixology, whatever you want to call it, for probably a better part of 15 to 20 years now. And when mixology started and craft cocktail started, that was kind of the biggest thing. Like everybody wanted like kind of like the latest flavor. And I remember like blood orange vodka was this big thing that everybody loved. And then it kind of like stopped. Like um, and people started getting on to whiskeys and rye and stuff like that. Can you kind of talk a little bit about what happened with that transition from your perspective? I, you know, um, towards the, you know, early 2000s, uh, vodka was kind of at its peak, right? And it was, it was a, for a number of reasons. Um, I think it was just easy. Uh, there wasn't a lot of focus in cocktails on, on flavor and quality and freshness and uniqueness. I mean, I would, I would guess that a majority of the volume of vodka that was sold was sold in vodka sodas or vodka tonics and, and maybe vodka martinis, mm -hmm. you know, all in all out of, out of those, uh, you know, tonic would be the most flavorful thing in, in, in of those three drinks. Um, probably a big, big dose of, uh, of Cosmos too, but um, it wasn't, you know, it, it was a drink that people drank because it was easy and cheap. And then, you know, there's probably some, certain percentage of that was the, the, I don't want to call it a health aspect, but what people might be been concerned about calories and, um, and false, con you know, misconceptions about, um, where hangovers come from and, uh, mixing beverages and, uh, detrimental effects of all these things. You know, there's, when it comes to drinking, there's generally a lot of ignorance. And so, you know, shows like yours and, and things that you and I have done in the last uh, couple of decades have been very focused on educating people to understand alcohol and cocktails. Uh, the way I always refer it back to the way they understand food. They don't think about food so much, um, you know, but, but they know their food and they don't often don't think about ordering their drinks in the same way they think about ordering their food when they go to a restaurant. It's a little more automatic and maybe not as uh, well researched, um, or oftentimes really not really applying 
actual experience that they have to their drink and just some kind of disconnect there. But um, as the cocktail scene started to take off, the focus became on out flavor. Like, hey, you can make all of these unique, cool drinks that have been around for a hundred years, but maybe nobody's made them in a hundred years. And you can be, you can apply like I was back then, uh, culinary techniques to to create new flavors, to put flavor combinations together that were not so uh, prevalent in in drinks before. But they, you know what? They actually work. They, you know, the, some of the earlier things that I was doing in mid two thousands with the simple stuff that I was getting press about was like putting, you know simple herbs together with lemon juice, lemon and thyme, muddle, you know, muddle some blueberries into that. And I, there was a drink I had called country time that got a lot of press and it was, and nowadays I, here we are in 2020. I said, I see these things pop up every once in a while, that same drink I was making 15 years ago, people are claiming, Hey, look what I created. <laughs> it's like, you know, at this point it's, it, it's, it was, it wasn't rocket science then and it's not rocket science now, but it was eye opening didn't think about drinks that well that way and vodka was a perfect base for that and i was making those kind of drinks because i was representing square one organic vodka and i was traveling the country trying to teach bartenders literally how to squeeze limes and make simple syrup um, when they were buying simple syrup and using shelf stable sour mix you know, those were those were the early days of of the the hurdles we had in getting people to make better cocktails. It was just helping them understand us as professionals what their available ingredients were and how they come together and 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 affect the resultant flavor, aroma, texture of a drink. And so, vodka was a simple way to do that because you vodka not bringing much flavor to the table. Its whole role is to amplify flavor. It 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 may, it takes a lemonade and it electric lemonade it makes it makes it more lemony. It, you know it just like sugar amplifies flavor. So when you can create bring a few things together and throw some vodka on it, it makes it an exciting drink because of the effect of of alcohol as a flavor amplifier without having the influence of of other layers of flavor that come from things like the barrel or additives or things that were macerated into it like juniper. <laughs> so I think that that, uh, that message was getting, it was very difficult to deliver because everyone in the craft cocktail scene at the time was just basically snubbing vodka because it was so popular. And I think in order to get, the craft cocktail message heard you had to get away from vodka because the vodka drinkers were not easily swayed so you had i think we were going after the the drinkers who were more interested in complex flavor so you could a, an easy first step was gin and of course the the gin snobs didn't want to hear you say gin is just flavored vodka but it is <laughs> so you get botanical complexity that you instill you you infuse into neutral spirits and you have gin right. various processes will do that but you get a flavored vodka it's not lemon it's not vanilla vodka it's something really complex so and higher proof generally speaking but um i think that we went through that period, I would say, from maybe 2005 to somewhere around 2012 or 13, maybe, where vodka was completely snubbed in cocktail bars. I mean, I remember, like, you know, Audrey Saunders, who's a, a very good friend. And back then, when we were just kind of new acquaintances, and she was bashing vodka, just not necessarily bashing it, but, but just saying uh, no vodka. There was no vodka in Pegu Club. And now Audrey would be the first to tell you the value of vodka. I mean, she she knew it then and she could talk about it then, but but it was exactly that. It was that vodka would not, vodka drinkers and vodka focus would not allow the Pegu message of 
excellent cocktails to, to move forward because you've wound up with a flood of people just asking for vodka sodas. And that's not what the purpose of Pegu Club was. It wasn't the purpose of Elixir either. So I think that by that 2012, 2013 time, we had really, I mean, you look at that, that's like eight years maybe, right? Let's say eight to 10 year time frame from nobody being interested in craft cocktails to it being everywhere. And we never, none of us would have predicted that it would have grown so fast. But in the end, gone on and we explored all these other spirits. And I think people were, were open again to vodka and, and in its, in its utility um, and its cultural background and all that. So it's just gotten a little bit more respect. Yeah, I think the, the, the time that I noticed when the, the, the switch got flipped on vodka, because to your point, it was kind of like, we don't touch that here in our bar program. And that was pretty widespread message with a lot of bars was when um, meals became a lot more popular. Um, I'm not sure who it was that started doing, you know, um, uh, mules and doing them in a copper mugs and all that. But that, as soon as that hit, that kind of changed the whole scene um, as far as like vodka and bar programs. And everybody was clamoring for, you know, copper uh, mule cups and, you know, more, more vodka and uh, especially with that. Um, and then it seems like people started to warm up to vodka again, um, just from my perspective anyways. Yeah, I definitely, the, the mule did, did more to bring vodka back than anything. Yeah, and it's funny, like you retelling kind of that history um, within 2005, I remember kind of looking back and kind of seeing these two different styles of bartending happening. It's obviously the lines are blurred now, but New York had their own style, which was kind of resurrecting spirit forward cocktails and resurrecting a lot of these um, drinks. And then on the West Coast in San Francisco, it was very much a kind of, they called it the market cocktail. Um, the green market cocktail, where everything was like muddled and, you know, you, you know the focus was more on fresh produce then kind of old school, um, you know, there was some old school stuff, but for the most part, the flavor came from a lot of the produce that we were lucky enough to have here. And then obviously the lines got a little bit blurred um, as things started to evolve, but those were the two camps that existed at that time. Yeah. I, I think I was, I think I was on the, I was on the cover of uh, nightclub and bar magazine and the, and the, uh, the title was green market mixology, something like that. <laughs> like 2008 or nine. So yeah, it's funny. Cause like, I, I fully agree with you. I think um, it's starting to come back a little bit more. And I remember kind of the big push. Um, I can't remember which tales it was, but the messaging of vodka pays the bills um, as you know, vodka is a necessary ingredient in the bar program because people understand it, they get it. There's not a lot of education that has to happen around it. Um, and I think once they embrace that, you know, bartenders mentality you embrace that. I, I think that may have something to contribute to the, the changing dialogue, dialogue that we have with vodka now and um, bar programs anyways. And it's also, you know, I think, like I said, the, the push was to get people the message of craft cocktails and what they could be. And it, maybe it got obnoxious on some levels to push vodka drinkers aside. And then, and then it was like, okay, but it's okay to be a vodka drinker. That it was like that turn. Like there was that acknowledgement. Like you said, you know what? Vodka sales are are, are pay are indeed paying my bills. They're, they're, I'm not going to snub my vodka drinkers because I. And there was that was like that message was on so many levels. There was you know that was there was that point, and it was probably a two to four year period where bartenders became fairly obnoxious <laughs> for for losing the the hospitality message and Agreed. being these you know being this like oh no no you're, you're drinking the wrong way rather right. than how would you like to drink yeah right exactly no i remember that and those were dark times <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so you mentioned square one and i have a lot of experience with square one um just with my uh, experience behind the bar um, but you mentioned to me that you helped launch and kind of create the business around or the demand around square one. Can you talk a little bit about kind of your involvement with that brand? Yeah. Allison, uh, Evano, the founder uh, and owner of square one, uh, she and I actually went to the same MBA program. And so we were connected through mutual alumni, uh, in the Bay area when she was launching the brand and I had, uh, you know, I guess friends had said to her, uh, have you met H and, and been to Elixir? And 
someone said to me, have you heard about Alice and her new vodka brand? I mean, one, it was woman owned, two, it was organic, um, completely different. And uh, so we got together, she came and brought me the product and uh, we tasted it and went through it before it launched. And I gave her a bunch of feedback. Um, and then when she launched, she, she contacted me, she said, hey, I, would you know anybody that would want to help me get this brand out there? I'm looking to, to uh, bring on some help. And I had, I had recently lost a consulting contract and was looking for a little side money as I was st struggling to get my bar into profitability. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she hired me as her brand ambassador. And this was like 2006, like there were... I was like, you know, what's a brand ambassador? There were no brand ambassadors. And, and even to, for the next few years, it was uh, the early days of that term even being used. And it was kind of funny because back then it was like, it was me, it was Charlotte Quasi and Simon Ford and Angus Winchester. And, um, you know, honestly, maybe a dozen to 15, um, most of which who were with really big brands that had big budgets. And I, here I am with this little, little known vodka. Uh, but it was great because Allison got to, she, she included me in everything. I got to do a lot of the product development. Um, we, we launched the cucumber and then, and botanical, and then I helped design. Um, we went on to launch the, uh, basil and, um, bergamot. Um, botanical was a super fun one to do too, because it was, eight botanicals, but no juniper. So it was, we were kind of bridging that, that vodka to gin message. And it pushed, it pushed me to be more creative because she was sending me around the country to talk to people about those messages of, you know, making better ingredients and, and using a high quality vodka to, to bring out the flavors and everything. But I also, I got to meet a lot of people and that was, that was a great thing for me. It was, a, it put me on the road and uh, which helped build the Elixir name and helped build my name, helped build uh, Square One. And Square One to this day is still, I think one of the best vodkas out there. Her product line is, is exceptional in quality and flavor. And it's incredibly unique too. The, the, other than a cucumber, and, and the cucumber is again, to my in my opinion, the, to this day, the best cucumber vodka on the market. And it was um, the first one, so or maybe the second. I can't remember. But um, after that, when we came out with botanical and this eight botanical approach to flavor, which was fruity and floral, from there we went and we did basil. And when we did basil, we took the, the lessons we had from botanical on a multi-botanical approach to flavor to create a singular flavor. So cucumber was straight up the middle cucumber. It tastes like fresh, beautiful cucumber. Basil actually has four different kinds of basil in it and a myriad of other botanicals behind it to give it richness and complexity. And But it ultimately, it tastes like a basil vodka just with all this complexity. And there's really nobody doing products like that or, or hadn't been. And so she pioneered a lot of different things with that line and and it's uh, and she's doing it again now she's launched an RTD line and she's launched a, a line of shelf stable mixers uh, and so she's still chugging along and um, and and still you know promoting the vodka sales which uh, is difficult for anybody right now that just as a small brand with you know the the current environment people are I think getting back to your earlier comment about why maybe people are going to vodka now is, is because of its familiarity and its its ease. Uh, they're doing the same thing with big brands. They're they're not you know the the smaller brands are kind of struggling uh, because for some odd reason people are are gravitating to, to just the big brands. And I see it in in my own bar and the, the bottle shop that we're running and selling selling retail. I'm getting requests for bottles that people normally don't even request for when they come to the bar. Yeah. And most of my business are my regulars. So it's an interesting phenomenon. And we're selling more vodka by the bottle now than we do by the glass or the cocktail in yeah. normal bar operations. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Uh, like um, we touched on this earlier, but it, it's I think it's that, you know, times are tough. People want what they want and, you know, they kind of go old school or what they're used to. Um, I've been hearing the same rumors as well. Just like, you know, people are gravitating towards those big brands because they have a lot of history with it and they don't want to experiment with stuff, you know, that doesn't have real value for them at home. Um, but I, I really like your kind of sleeper approach. 
with uh, square one with the botanicals, kind of bridging that gap between gin and vodka. Um, you know, maybe pushing people either into gin or pulling people in from gin into vodka. I think that's a, a cool concept. And uh, I really liked um, the, the, um, the approach you guys took with that brand. Like I said, I'm very familiar with it. And I think to your point, I think they were, they are a very quality product uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, thanks. And it was a really fun thing to, to work on to this day. One of my you know, proudest things that I've done, I think. I hope she can, hope she can continue to, to grow and, and do well with it. Yeah, so I want to kind of backtrack and take a step back because we've kind of talked a little bit about vodka, but um, maybe bring it back all the way to the basics of vodka. So um, can you tell us kind of what separates vodka from all the other spirit categories as far as like ingredients and maybe some different types of vodka that might be out there? Well, vodka is made, the thing about vodka is it can be made from anything. If you can ferment it into alcohol, it can be distilled into vodka. So you've got vodkas out there that are made from milk, that are made from honey, that are made from all kinds of, of, of ingredients. Whereas, you know, you look at whiskey, whiskey is a distillate made from grain that's been aged. Brandy is a distillate that's made from fruit, fruit wine. Um, uh, agave spirits are made from agave plants, which are fructans. They're not, you know, they're not fruit. They're not grain. It's a completely different source. Uh, but vodka can be made from anything. So it opens up the possibilities for it to be made anywhere by anybody. Um, <clears throat> it does have to be distilled to a high level. So it's generally made on a, on a, on a column still. And, um, 96.7 is the uh, um, percentage alcohol like that, that I think is the max, I believe. Um, and, that, but you know, generally vodkas are going to be distilled above 94 mm -hmm. and cause even when you get down to 92, 92.5, you're, you've got whiskeys that are distilled there. You've got rums, you've got, you know, there's, believe it or not, a very big difference in, in something at 92 versus 96. And once you, and then there's different controls on these other categories where you can't still it above a certain point and still call it that category because you want to retain the congeners in, in that distillate that give it the characteristics that are are defining that define that spirit by its flavor and aroma mm -hmm. whereas when you get into vodka you're you're distilling it out to the point where there really is uh it's not the flavorless colorless odorless definition that uh i believe has just been changed if i'm not mistaken i think they just yeah. dvd but just changed the definition of vodka oh, okay um or it's in, or it's in discussion um but you know the the reality, and I used to again, but going out on the on the the square one train, I I used to say this all the time. But, but that's not true. Good vodka does have character. There's flavor. There's texture. There's aroma, and it, and it is all based on, generally speaking, what the raw ingredient is, the quality of that raw ingredient, and the distillation process. So there's there's a finessing of the the still that will allow you to create the kind of vodka that you want, and the difference between a nuanced craft vodka and a high production industrial vodka is that, you know, that crafting of changing it at a degree or two, or trying to retain a certain note of on the aroma or on the, on the palate. Um, in a high production, cheap vodka, you're not getting that. It's, uh, you know, not made to be that way. And it's, it's got its role too, I suppose. So, um classically um speaking vodka the history of vodka goes back to the russian and and polish production both lay claim to its uh, origin uh no real documented proof of one over the other but um what they would have been making vodka from in, in those days would have been primarily wheat or rye, uh, grains that grow well in those areas. Rye particularly grows well in, 
in, in colder climates, colder, drier climates. So you'll, that's why you'll see most rye uh, production in the U.S. happening in northern states and, and an abundance in Canada. Um, and the potato thing is a fascinating thing. That's always puzzled me. For some reason, I, I just never, I don't know why so many people, and I, I've yet to see anybody write an article about or anything why so many americans in particular think all vodka is made from potato the the reality is that there are few vodkas made from potato mm -hmm. making vodka from potatoes is more costly and you t it takes a lot of potatoes to be able to create enough uh sugar to to ferment and distill um the history of that goes back to the poles really where uh, the Habsburgs, the Habsburg and the Habsburg Empire, that they, they brought potatoes to Poland from the Americas because the potato is not indigenous to Europe. And what the Poles found being sacked from one side or the other, whether it was the Russians or the Germans coming in and, and attacking Polish villages and burning them to the ground, was that when you when you have potatoes, uh, you can't burn your potatoes because they're underground. So their village could be burned to the ground and they could still make vodka. <laughs> so, <clears throat> <laughs> so, the, um, you know, Chopin, I think is probably my favorite of, of the potato vodkas. And, uh, actually I did a, uh, they have, they have many, uh, new products out now. And I remember I did a, I did a class in Chicago with Bridget Albert and her, uh, spirits Academy. I was, I was, uh, kind of, co-build with the founder of Chopin. Uh, I can't remember his name now, but I got up there and I did my whole square one spiel about organic and, you know, it's made in Idaho and, uh, and from this great water source and talking about organics and everything. And, and, you know, I thought I gave a great presentation. Then I sat down and then the Chopin guy got up there and I was just like, he just, he blew my socks off. I mean, we did this tasting of different potatoes from different harvests, different times of the year. And they were all, I mean, just to, to show what it could really do in vodka. It was, it was fascinating. And now I know that they've, they've launched several of those as different, different products, which is great. You can really see how different raw ingredients do affect the flavor, but I've always liked rye vodka, um, whether it's American rye like in Square One or a Polish rye like like Belvedere. Um, two different, completely uh, completely different rye uh, grains and two different vodkas. But I think rye, just like in vodka, or just like in whiskey, you know, the rye it's the character of the grain that's showing in the spirit, and it it punches punches through. It's got some bite. It's got some spice, and uh, I really like that in both in mixing because it helps punch through in the recipe, um, but also in sipping. And then you get into like a wheat vodka, which is probably, uh, I, I would venture to say the, the majority of vodkas out there are, are, uh, are wheat. And there are some differences, but winter wheat is a, is a very popular one. And it, and it gives this really bready, yeasty kind of um, bakery smell and, and taste like Absolute's a great example of that. Um, Absolute to me is a very yeasty, bready kind of vodka. Um, and then you have corn, which is probably the least expensive between corn and sugar. Um, the least expensive to produce, especially if it's commoditized corn, and which is you know the majority of it. Then um, there are some that can claim organic corn sources, but that that's that's a a much more limited crop than people realize. Um, it's mostly commodity. Uh, I guess you know, claiming non-MGO, uh, non-GMO uh, corn is an important one, but again, difficult and rare. But corn is uh, that's commodity right there. That's you know, that's big bulk. You're gonna you're gonna find a lot of your uh, lower priced vodkas being corn. Um, and that's not to say that they're bad, uh, but different. There's there's a really good one here that I've been supporting at, at Elixir called Hetchy. It's a San Francisco brand made with Hetch Hetchy water from our, our water source, and and it's a corn vodka. And there's a, for like uh, sugar beets, right? Is that kind of another 
staple uh, crop for for um, for vodka as well as a base. Yeah, because sugar beets are just produced sugar. It's sugar from sugar beets. So it's um, you know I, I think when you throw the word beet in there, that might that would mislead people on a on a flavor source. But right. it's a, you're extracting sugar from a sugar beet, which was the the crop that changed the sugar industry in France once France um, started cultivating sugar beet and using it in spirits, it killed the, the sugar trade with the Caribbean. And that really changed the rum industry and, you know, uh, the source of sugar and alcohol for a lot of French distillates, which the French make a lot of great distillates, like like Cointreau, for example, is made from sugar beet uh, distillate and sweetened with sugar from sugar beet. So um, it's a it's a commodity product, but it is, it's a sugar source. Um, yeah. There's a couple of exciting vodkas that I've had uh, recently that I like uh, with different sources. One is a, another San Francisco brand called Rocket, uh, which is made from apples. And it really does have a nice apple character to it. Um, another one that I've really uh, enjoyed recently is Bar Hill out of Vermont. It makes a really lovely vodka out of honey. And not only do you get this great honey floral aroma and taste on the palate uh, but it's got this viscosity that's that's smooth like honey um, it's a it's a real unique one it's a little on the, the higher end uh, cost spectrum but uh but definitely a distinctive vodka yeah and then i remember um many years ago probably about a decade ago there was an you were talking about potatoes and the nuance with chopin and all these different types um did carlson gold ever come across your bar um, yeah, absolutely. That was a really interesting vodka. Um, and they kind of went that Chopin route where they, if I, if I remember correctly, and you probably know this better than me, but they had vintages of their vodka yeah. made from very specific potatoes. And I think I might have a bottle of it here. Um, but the cool, it's yeah, right it was, the top shelf. I, you know what? There somewhere, I think. Yeah, um, I, ha I haven't had it in a while, but it was it, it was excellent. I, and again, I don't know if it's even still out there. I don't know if they had they had a big, really big push. I'm sure it's still available. Yeah, and uh, I remember they were kind of a flash in a plant, pan, and I hope they're still around because they do a really cool, interesting product. But it tastes like potato. Like you taste it, and you're like, this, this yeah, is like a freaking potato, and it's great. <laughs> and it, it's. Testament to that, that you can get the character of the, of the raw ingredient in there. And, and potato vodkas are, are really also about the, that mouthfeel. They're great sippers because of the mouthfeel. Sure. Um, I, I, I don't like them as much for mixing because I feel that the flavor is super soft, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of juxtaposition to what I said about rye. I like, you know, the, to me, the robust character of a rye vodka is like that classic uh, way of drink Russian way of drinking with you know a, a cold shot of vodka to go with your food it's a, it's a pairing more than a cocktail and that rye really punches through and I like that but I also like with this with, with the Carlson and, and, and good potato vodkas is that that creamy viscosity that you get on a potato vodka yeah so um, I imagine on your uh, your ventures with square one and education around the country um, that you came across a lot of Miss a lot of probably uh, unwarranted uh, things as associated to vodka. Uh, what were some of your favorite comments that people threw at you um, with vodka? Well, there's there's the potato one. Mm -hmm. All vodka is made from potato. You, know, you got to nip that in the butt right away. <laughs> um, um, another is that the is the hangover thing is you know like people don't understand what really gives you a hangover. And so there are a lot of myths tied to um, vodka not giving you a hangover, you know, not, not, not on the negative side, I guess to, to vodka's credit, a lot of vodka drinkers say they drink vodka because it doesn't give them a hangover. To which I say, you know, it, it, it's probably very true. I'm never going to dispel somebody's personal physical experience with the, with the product, but um, there are reasons for it because the, the, the things that give you a hangover are the additional things in a, a liquid beyond the alcohol, um, as well as bad alcohols, right? So there's, dis there's distillation quality and 
where the cuts are made without getting into a whole distillation lesson. Um, there are bad alcohols and good alcohols that come off of a still in the production of a spirit. And so when you, long story short, you, you, you cut the heads or the tails, you, you make cuts that you, you remove the, the stuff that's not good. And then you bottle the stuff that's good. Well, in any production, say the yield is this much. If you keep half of that, and that's what you bottle, then you need to make a return on your investment for that production run that is only yielding half of what's what's sellable is only half of what is produced. If you change the boundary of that and you say, you know, maybe we'll sell three quarters of it instead of half. Now you have more to sell and you're not throwing away so much. So your margins can increase and your, you know, your profitability can increase. And so um, you can include some parts of the vodka that maybe the more uh, meticulous producer would not include in there. And so some of those elements are what are really going to give you uh, more of a hangover. And then you get into barrel aged spirits. You're, you're putting a spirit that's just as potentially clean, clean, although, like I said before, you lower the distillation level. So you, what's coming off the still is not as completely pure. That means there's more congeners in there that, that uh, are naturally occurring compounds in the distillation process that provide flavor and aroma, but can also affect your body or physiology differently than somebody else. And maybe you don't react well to that. Then you put that spirit into a barrel and the bar and the spirit extracts compounds from the barrel that both provide color and flavor and texture uh, while going through the charcoal in the barrel, which has an adsorptive property. And the adsorptive property of the charcoal filter extracts some of those things that maybe would harm you, but it also adds things to it. And again, not necessarily to harm you, but they may be compounds that uh, your body does not react well to. And you'll, you'll see what people will say stuff like, I, I can't drink red wine because of the sulfites. That may or may not be true. There may be other things in red wine that don't, that your body doesn't react to. So I think that, you know, the hangover argument has a lot to do with understanding your own body and how the things that you're, you're drinking or eating, put the things that you're putting into your body, how your body's going to react to those. And uh, one, what gives one person a really bad hangover may not give the next person that. Um, and there's always but, the question about quantity, right? That's all. Oh, yeah. There's, quantity. <laughs> there's, there's, there's undeniables. There's quantity. There's cheap alcohol. There's sugar. Right. You know, those things, too much of it to, or, and, and dehydration. Like right. all, the, all of those are a factor in a hangover no matter what. <laughs> yeah, that, that question always kind of cracks me up. I'm like, well, what's in your cocktail? And they're like, oh, all these things. Well, how many did you have? Well, I had like six of them. Like, well, that might be. But it was the vodka that gave me the hangover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one always cracks me up. Now, one of the last questions I have for you um, is, you know, there's this myth, um, and this is something that we've seen with a couple different brands here. Actually, vodka has a long history of this. The number of distillations equal quality. Um, and when we talked about the distillation, you know, most of the vodkas being produced now are being done on column stills, which not exactly kind of a one-to-one -one as far as number of times of, of distillation. But then you see things like, oh, it's filtered through diamonds or it's filtered like through all these other things. Like when it comes down to it, does it actually matter? Does the number of times that a, um, a vodka has been distilled actually have any correlation with quality? It's difficult to say because of the lack of control over or definition over what times distilled means. There's so many um, ways that you can spin it. It's total marketing, right? You can say a, a classic two column still is called a coffee still, like one of the you know, original column stills, right? Uh, but generally a coffee still is what's going to be, you're going to see more in rum production than in vodka production. Um, and it can actually produce a more rich spirit than pot, than a pot still, uh, depending on how it's used. But vodka is usually made in a four or five column still, or at least a, a three. Anyway, I'd say the three to five, maybe it's even six. Mm -hmm. And basically each of those columns, the, the, the more columns there are, you're just kind of stretching. It's the, the, the process is the same. It's just, you're kind of stretching it out into more minutia 
in how you can control your distillation process. The more plates you have within the column, the more columns that you have, you're, it's again, from start to finish, it's the same process. It's just giving you more and more controls. And that's the thing about a column still, is it, it's a tool that the right distiller can use to completely manipulate the process and extract exactly what it is they want out of it. Mm -hmm. with, a pot, with a pot still, you don't have so many controls. It's all about, it's a little bit more magic, right? It's a little more finesse and understanding your, where to tickle your still to get the right thing out of it. But a, a six column still is a very precise instrument. And so you can really, uh, hone in on the the right aromas and flavors that you want to get and so saying times distilled is is almost undefinable and most brands that you would put the question to and say well what do you, what do you mean by six times distilled I, I would venture to say most of their sales rep couldn't even answer that um and getting to the to technical geeky question is means getting to that person which you probably can't get to either so it, it is marketing jargon that's hard to decipher. And I, it's not something that I, I've always said, don't even look at that. I would tell most consumers, don't, don't look at that. Don't look at any of the marketing hype because marketing is, is more so in vodka than just about any other spirit. The only thing they, they have to, to throw at you and they're hoping to get those simple hooks. Um, the, the filtration thing is is another one. It's, you know, filtration's filtration. Whether you're using diamonds or charcoal, the whole idea is to is to capture um, the things you're trying to remove. Um, diamonds may sound fancier, but you know, are, are they more effective? I doubt it. Right. Quite frankly. Um, so it's kind of funny. It reminds me back in those days, I remember sitting in the pool at the Hotel Monteleone at Tails. This is probably like 2009. I'm in the pool with uh, Colin Appiah, who is now with Bacardi. Uh, but back then he was the, he was the vodka brand ambassador for uh, Ulovka Vodka mm -hmm. out of London. And uh Somebody, I won't, I won't say the brand because I know they're still around, but somebody from another brand came over uh, as he and I were just, were just hanging out in the pool, having fun. You know, it was, it was, it was pretty chill. There weren't, it wasn't like a big party or anything. It was just he and I having a drink and chatting in the pool. And somebody literally came up to the pool, to the edge of the pool, got down on their, on their toes and said, hey, guys, come here, come here. Uh, and then he pulls out the, the bottle and he's like, can I tell you about our vodka? It's... <laughs> 10 times distilled and, and filtered through diamond dust and Colin and I just <laughs> Colin and I just look at each other and laugh and I'll never forget Colin looking at me he looks at me and he looks back up at this guy and he says mate do you know who we are <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't blame the guy for trying right Oh no, not at all. But it was just like you know, that's his lead was the diamond dust filtration thing. I was, we were both just cracked up. Oh, too but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So those things, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, I think it's the same thing I've taught, and I'm sure you do too, to people. Is, you know your palate. Mm -hmm. You know, the 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 body the, the body is amazingly intuitive. If you put something in your mouth, and your body goes. <laughs> 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 or you feel that burn, you know, that's your body telling poison, poison, alert, alert. <laughs> right. I think I, the first and, time that happened to me was my first exposure with Mickey's uh, Big Mouth, uh, the malt liquor. Yeah. My body just was yep. like, nope, no, 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 not going to have this, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't listen, but it was, you know, <laughs> you learn. <laughs> Um, and you know, was the other thing about vodka is it, it's, it's use it as mouthwash. Rinse your mouth out. Spit that first one out. It's just like any kind of tasting of a spirit. Give yourself that clean start, and then put that vodka in your mouth and be like, "Do I like it or do I not? Do I do I taste anything or is it just blah? Sure. Is, how does it how does it feel in my mouth? You know, and those those are just quick, easy, simple questions, and you can establish. And then you're like, okay, try it with a a $15 bottle versus a $40 bottle and don't remind yourself of the price. Just say, which one do I like better? And is it, is it worth a $30 upgrade? Yeah. 
So last question for you, I promise. Um, and that is when we're talking about making cocktails and using vodka in drinks, is there a particular style that you usually gravitate towards? I, I know you mentioned rye is kind of like chill it, serve it with dinner, kind of enjoy it on its own kind of thing because it has just that, that punch to it. Um, but is there a style of vodka that you usually kind of start off with as far as like mixing? Yeah, it, it is usually a stronger, uh, a, a stronger something, you know, most vodkas are, are 80 proof, 40%. And, uh, the, although there are some stronger ones, um, if, if you're holding that alcoholic strength line equal, then I am looking for flavor bite to punch through in a drink. So, um, I w I would like something even with a maybe like I, I think of it as like kettle one as a as a vodka that's got some bite to it. It's a wheat vodka, but it's got some bite to it. It's got this kind of medicinal quality to it um, that I like. And for me, that's a really good martini vodka. If I'm going to have a vodka martini, mm -hmm. um, and it's also one that will punch through in some some drinks for me. Um, I, it holds up well to citrus, you know? Uh, so that's what I'm looking for. Generally speaking, that's kind of my preferences. If it's, if it's not rye, it's, it, it's got, it still at least got to have some kind of bite to it. Absolutely. Very cool. So, um, one of the things I love about talking to you and we kind of chat about this before we recorded is you're always doing stuff. You've got more pans in the fire than probably anybody I know. Um, so I'd love for you to kind of talk about some of the things that you're doing now, um, you know, and kind of put a spotlight on it. Um, well, besides getting Elixir back open, um, you know, which is a daily, you know, as I've, I've told my team, uh, we're, we're striving for a little improvement every day and, hoping that the uh, health situation holds and improves and we can continue to get uh, a little more traffic all the time. We've got, uh, we've got two parklets open with the bar right now and doing outdoor service six days a week, four to nine, and we're opening at noon on the weekends and things are going well. We're, we're still in our San Francisco summer here where we, we've got some beautiful weather today and yesterday and, and this week. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we've seen the, the end of massive fires. Um, it's been a horrible season, as you know, yeah. uh, for air quality and everything. So the bar is, you know, we're pushing forward on the bar, but um, most of my days, the majority of my days are, are, are spent now working on my mixer line. I, I'm part of a, a cocktail mixer company called Fresh Victor uh, that my friend Ken McKenzie founded and uh, invited me in to help with a number of years ago. We've been at it uh, on a number of levels and, and it's going quite well now. We've make cold pressed juice based cocktail mixers that are refrigerated and fresh. We have seven different flavors that are available. Uh, now, primarily uh, the consumer level, we launched a 16 ounce package uh, during the COVID times. Prior to that, we were primarily focused on on-premise operations uh, with a lot of uh, high volume accounts like Disney Epcot Center, the, the Mexico Pavilion and a number of uh, Las Vegas casinos and some hotels and national chains that are using our stuff as the base of their margaritas and some other drinks. And But uh, we've launched the consumer brand in a direct-to-consumer level on our website at freshvictor.com. And that had been uh, available in seven states in the West. And uh, within about a week to two, it's going to be available to everyone in the country. So they'll be able to go on freshvictor.com and get uh, Fresh Victor delivered direct to their door. Uh, as we continue to open grocers and, and liquor outlets around the country and focus on that. So that's the most exciting thing right now is Fresh Victor is uh, it's a completely different kind of mixer. It's, you know, as you, as you know, fresh, there's nothing like fresh and most mixers out there are shelf stable. And even if they say they're made with fresh juice, they're still shelf stable. They've got stabilizers and extra sugar and it's not the same as uh, drinking a fresh juice drink. So that's my big my big effort besides the bar and working on some, I've always got some consulting projects and stuff in the wings and judging spirits competitions and and those things. But these yeah, days I'm it's actually on your, uh, Fresh your Victor. And, um, for Fresh Victor, I'm on your website now and there's some great flavors in here. Like they're all really good. The uh, There was one for pomegranate that caught my eye. 
sounds really good. Uh, uh, yeah, the cactus pear and pomegranate is my favorite. That's the most versatile. It's like it works with aged and unaged spirits alike. And the the uh, the palm paloma is the drink I've been making all summer. It's just basically a paloma with a little splash of that cactus pear and pomegranate. It's like fruity and delicious, and it makes a great non alcoholic version too. My, that my daughter is constantly asking for. <laughs> <laughs> So that's funny. If you go on the blends page of our website, that's where there's a bunch of my recipes there for each of the products and some for each one of them has a, a low alcohol and a no alcohol recipe as well. Very cool. Yeah, it's definitely catching my eye and I think I'm going to have to order some of this stuff. Um, but uh, I can't thank you enough, uh, H. I know you're a busy man. You're always busy every time I talk to you. And uh, I can't thank you enough for the education and kind of the your perspective on vodka. I think um, vodka vodka has kind of gotten a bad rap, um, you know, kind of the victim of its own popularity in the beginning. Um, but I think to kind of the things you talked about, I think there's a lot of diversity in the category. And I think that deserves kind of another look and uh, maybe not so much uh, attitude around it as a uh, as a base spirit. Um, but like I said, I can't thank you enough. And we'll link to all the, the things that you mentioned in the show notes. Um, so Fresh Victor, your bar. Um, and uh, like I said, man, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Great to see you. Yeah, you as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. So once again, thanks to H for his time and his expertise around the subject of vodka. I know I learned a lot about this uh, particular category today, and I have even more respect uh, for vodka in general as a result of it. Um, so once again, thanks, H. Uh, now, if you found this podcast interesting and you want to follow up with any of the show notes, head on over to mixologytalk.com 185, and you can find links to some of the items that we're talking about there. Now, uh, we're just now getting into the holidays, and I know people are starting to think about gift giving and all that. So uh, if you're looking for gifts for yourself or for that cocktail lover in your, in your life, uh, head on over to our shop at shop.abarabub.com and you can take a look at some of the tools that I think are some of the best in the industry. I know I have a little bit of a bias there, but uh, I hope you agree with me as well. So yeah, definitely head on over to shop.abarabub.com. Now we're going to have some more podcasts for you in the future, but until then, I hope you guys are enjoying a great cocktail and staying healthy and happy out there. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>